Welcome to Intrinsic Motivation from a Homie's Perspective podcast, where we meet experts from all walks of life to learn their intrinsic motivation so that they can share it with the world. What do we have in store today? Stay tuned to find out more. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everybody out there in podcast land. You are in tune to another episode of Intrinsic Motivation from a Homie's Perspective. This is Hamza. And I am David. And I must say, last year, I was really in tune every week to Fox TV show, watching the TV show called The Resident. And haven't watched a lot of medical shows, but some of it seemed like it was over the top until I reached out to the guest that we have today. She's going to talk about what happens behind the scenes in the hospital in the medical environment. And some of the things that we would only think happens on television, is it real or not? We're going to talk about medical bullying, how it is rampant, and how it affects patient safety. Uh, Without further ado, I'd like to welcome Sharon Barrett to the podcast. Welcome, Sharon. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Yeah, thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks for being here. And and, I didn't mention in in your intro, but... I used to hang out, not hang out, but I used to work in your your part of town as far as your training. You you were a physician's assistant at Baylor College of Medicine, and um, we used to, my old firm used to work in the medical center, so we worked at MD Anderson. We did some animal labs at Baylor College of Medicine as well. And so I'm really interested in talking to you about the medical bullying because as a civilian on the outside, I know that if a researcher was going to get a lot of money and we were designing a new building for them, they could pretty much do anything they want and they could, you know, be a king or they could, you know, just wield a lot of power. And But you were behind the scenes. So just really, again, happy that you were able to make the podcast today. Well, I appreciate the invite. And so you you were a physician's assistant at Baylor. Did you... I know you got your master's in public health from the University of Texas School of Public Health. So you, right after grad school, you stayed in the area of public health? How how did that come about? (laughs) I actually got my physician assistant degree from Baylor College of Medicine. So that's where my bachelor's degree comes from. Um, Then I stayed in the Houston area, and I actually went across the street to work at MD Anderson, and I worked in oncology there for three years. Um, and then I decided at that point in time to go back and get my master's degree at UT School of Public Health, which is um, just immediately across the street from MD Anderson. Um, so I was able to work at St. Luke's, which is across the street a different way from MD Anderson. Um, it's immediately west of MD Anderson, and UT School of Public Health is immediately south of MD Anderson. So I was able to walk to and from school and work at St. Luke's while I was doing infectious disease, um, working in that kind of a practice as a PA. And once I finished with that degree, um, I decided to, I also did some work up in Livingston while I was getting my master's thesis collected up there at the Rural Health Clinic. But once I was totally done with my degree, then I came back into Houston and I started working in pediatrics and got back into oncology for a while, got into primary care for a while, um, really got into clinical research and doing all kinds of drug research and study drug research. And I did that for 16, 18 years total. Um, being the study drug coordinator to being all the way up to being a co-PI on a National Institutes of Health clinical grants that we submitted to them for $1.3 million, and they came back to me and said, publish your data and we'll give you the money. So I started publishing my data, at which point in time I went back to school, back down to UT, back down to Houston, to the School of Public Health, and started working on my doctorate in clinical trials epidemiology. So I wasn't able to finish that degree. I ended up having to come back to Denver and help take care of my mother who was ailing at that point in time and had had open heart surgery. So then I had to quit the degree and just return back to being a PA. So that's where I'm at at present time. Gotcha. 
Oh, I thought David was jumping in. Um, I do want to say that I remember uh, the, our, I worked with an architecture firm, architecture and engineering firm, and so we designed research labs around the world, and specifically in the country, I worked with a lot of university work, and a lot of universities were vying for rail systems so that co the collaborations could happen with you know top institutions across the state, and. Houston was one of the first places to get that rail system just so that there can be greater collaboration with the, with the medical center. So it was just really interesting to be a part of that from the outside. And you were, you know, you, with your advanced degrees, you were able to see a lot of different environments. And since we're talking about medical bullying, I was just wondering before we dive into all of it, were you able to see similarities in the different environments or were they totally different? Um, as far as medical bullying went, bullying is bullying. Um, you know, the scenarios are a little bit different in regards to who's doing it and why. But most of the bullying occurred from a senior superior, uh, like a senior attending, to either a junior attending or to the residents for the most part. Um, it also occurred with some of the older nurses on the floor to the younger nurses on the floor who then turned around and bullied the student nurses on the floor. It just, it's, it has a lot to do with the sense of power and the fact that you're going to do this because I tell you you're going to do this and I'm not going to hear any backlash about it. Do you feel that with bullying, I like to know, especially from a medical environment, do, can you talk about when it, you first saw it happening? Because on the outside, we always imagine, you know, everything's kind of more so focused on patient care. And so everyone kind of puts their differences aside and make everything happen to the greatest good, but that may not be the case. No, that's not always the case. I wish it was the case 100% of the time, but it's not um, because I know of several scenarios myself where patient care was compromised, just having a, a relationship with a patient can be compromised because physicians are into their ego and their pride and you don't do it this way because this is the way it's always been done and we're going to do it this way in the future and you just broke the, you know, the, um, what we expect and what we accept from people. Um, just as a, for instance, I used to, when I went back into oncology and I was working in, I was working in bone marrow transplant up in Milwaukee, and this is many, many, many years ago, um, I had a senior attending who was, at that point in time, we were four days apart in age. She was very insecure. She did not have any self-confidence. Other senior attendings demeaned her, so she turned around and demeaned us, who were in lower authority from her. And there was a scenario where I had a patient that I had been taking care of for a whole month. She had done her transplant because she had acute leukemia. She had completely finished the whole transplant. She had done very well. She was discharged back home, and within three days, she was back in the hospital. She had a major grand mal seizure. We ended up working her up and found out that it was not because of her leukemia coming back um, into her meninges, which is a part of your brain. Uh, her type of leukemia could invade the meninges, and she was just deathly afraid that that's what had happened. So when we finally got her worked up, got the MRI done and everything else, um, the attending told us that she would be up there in, you know, a couple of hours and go and talk to the patient and tell her that this was a medication side effect to the anti-rejection medication she was on. And I thought, okay, that's fine. Well, we waited around for four hours for the attending to show up on the floor to go in and talk to her. And in the meantime, she and her mom were just in absolute tears. They could not quit crying in the room because they truly believed that her leukemia was back. And subsequently, if it had come back, she would have been given a death sentence because there's nothing else to do for her. 
Um, and so I walked in just trying to calm her down, and she looked at me, and she begged me and begged me and begged me to tell her the truth because she couldn't handle it anymore. Four hours of being, you know, in high stress, high anxiety, just totally wiped out emotionally. She just begged me to tell her the truth. So I sat down with her, and I said, here's what's going on. It's not leukemia. It's a side effect of the medication. We're going to switch you to something else, and we're waiting for the attending to come up and tell you that. But I can, I can guarantee that's what's going on. And the relief on her face and her mother's face was just like immediately and instantaneously they hugged me and they said, thank you, thank you for telling us the truth. Nobody would even talk to us. Nobody would even you know, come back and tell us anything. And we've just been sitting here for four hours in tears. And I says, I understand. I've been waiting for the attending to show back up also, and she hasn't showed back up. And she told us she would. And finally, an hour later, she showed up. She went in. She talked to the patient. She came out, and she just about unloaded on me about how dare you do that. How dare you, you know, um, usurp my authority that I'm the attending on the floor and you're just a mere PA and you shouldn't have said that. I said, she was my patient. And this is what happened. And you took five hours when you told me you were going to be for four hours and you still didn't show up. I said, it's not fair to that patient what you did to her. And she still wouldn't agree with me. And I eventually had to leave. But I mean, you know, just common courtesy, you go in and you explain things to patients and you don't keep them waiting for hours on end. But other things similar to that also happened and patients don't always get the best of care because physicians are too wrapped up in their culture of being a bully to others to even think about it. So, Sharon, let me ask you this. In in all your years and your experience, have you noticed the in, in regards to males and females, do, do do women tend to get bullied more, or men, or the kind of you know equal? On the resident side, um, now a resident is a medical student who's graduated from med school and is now doing their postgraduate training, and the residency training programs can take anywhere between three to five years based on which program you go into whether it's like internal medicine or surgery, which is five years. Um, And so when you're doing your residency, I don't think it really matters whether, you know, you're a female or a male. You're still just going to get demeaned and you're still going to get, you know, beat up on and you have sleep deprivation going on. And, you know, the senior senior attendings just beat, beat up on you because they were beat up on when they were going through their residency So they think it's only fair to beat up on the younger residents. And so when when you're doing your residency, I don't think it really makes a lot of difference. When you're a senior attending, I think there's more bullying that goes on between men attendings to female junior attendings. I would also say it makes me think of... of High school, because that's always in the news now with the shootings and such, where um, they're usually underclassmen, and, or they've been picked on since they were underclassmen, and, and it's always been a rite of passage for the seniors to kind of pick on the junior, so power kind of rolls down the hill. And it also made me think of uh, with the Greek life, so with fraternities and sororities, can't really speak on the sorority side, but when I speak with the older gentlemen that were in fraternities in like the 60s and 70s, they were like, you guys got it easy. And it's kind of like we didn't get the, the rite of passage that they did because they had to go through so much um, bullying, <laughs> as a nice way to put it. And so do you feel that it's kind of like you're earning your stripes or that that's where it's not, I mean, it's accepted, it seems, on some level? Well, I mean, what you're talking about with the fraternities is is what's called hazing, um, yeah. which is unfortunate because there's been several deaths of freshman college, you know, males who have come into a fraternity and they've been hazed and they've died. Um, so that's the unfortunate end result of some of those activities. As far as medical bullying goes and, you know, the culture of medicine, I think some of it is just, you you 
go to med school and you and you're out there in the clinics and you're doing your clinical work as a medical student and you see that the culture is one that demeans you because you don't know enough and you see the residents who are sleep deprived you see the residents are depressed they're ang they have anxiety Dr. Pamela Wimble, who's, who's now doing a phenomenal amount of work um, in regards to physician suicide, and you have to remember that one physician or more, sometimes it's more, um, per day are committing suicide and killing themselves because they are depressed, they have anxiety, they're trying being a whistleblower to bring the light to hear something that's really going wrong and this needs to be changed. Um, there's several different things that lead into suicide, but Dr. Wimble is really doing an incredible job in following up and being accessible to the medical students and the residents and the physicians who are all thinking of suicide and she's got a hotline and she will answer it 24 hours a day to help these physicians and these student doctors find their way again because they need to be able to find their way and they need to have somebody who can support them. So it, 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 medical bullying runs the rampant up from bullying to, you know, add in depression and anxiety, which 75% of all medical students and residents and attendings have a problem with, according to Dr. Wimble's research. You add that in on top of you know, you have to be perfect. You can't make a mistake. And if you make a mistake, where are you going to find relief? Where are you going to find somebody who can show you some grace or show you some understanding or show you, you know, this is okay. I made that mistake too when I was a resident. Uh, there's, there's not a lot of camaraderie between physicians, and especially when a physician makes a mistake. It's like, oh my goodness, I just made a mistake, and then they go into this self-condemnation um, attitude, which doesn't help anybody at all. Now, I wanted to bring up the whole hazing and what have you, because, you know, once upon a time it was unknown, and then it was brought to the light. And as an institution, I mean, fraternity of our nation and, and international in some respects, and so as a larger institution, it takes a lot longer for change to happen. And so I was just wondering if you could talk about some of the small changes or, you know, any, any level of change. For example, uh, the time that was required to work in the 70s, 80s, and 90s versus now, it seems like they still may be sleep deprived, but compared to the 70s and 80s, they have it a little bit better. Well, in regards to the sleep deprivation, the American, uh, let me give you, Sleep deprivation prior to 1984 was horrible. Um, it was residents were expected to work 120 hours per week. And when you think that there's only 106, 187 hours in a week, I mean, they're not even able to sleep anywhere close to where they need to be able to sleep to be able to function the next day. So in 1984 is when Libby Zion died in New York State due to a sleep-deprived resident who saw her in the ER. And because of that case, it took five years for her family to take that case through the civil courts and sue the hospital, and, and they won their case. And so in 1989 is when the New York State Health Commission finally came down on all of the hospitals in New York State and said, from here on out, you will no longer be allowed to have the residents scheduled for 120 hours plus or more a week. They can only be scheduled for 80 hours per week. Now, 80 hours is still an awful lot of time, but at least it's not as bad as the 120 hours. Um, but yet it took another 14 years after that. It took until 2003 for the Accreditation Council for Graduate Medical Education, which is a nationwide uh, group that meets in Chicago to finally agree that all the other 49 states had to comply with the 80-hour resident work week. And with that, it has definitely helped with the residents who are 
they're still sleep deprived, but they're not as sleep deprived. They're still having some problems, but it's not as bad. So that's been one cultural shift, which has been absolutely necessary and I remember when that occurred here in Denver because I was working at Denver Health and the chairman of our Department of Medicine was trying to figure out how to get the residents scheduled with an 80-hour work week and this kind of stuff and boy those senior attendings in the Department of Medicine were like wow they've got it really easy you know I used to have to work 120 plus hours a week and I made it why can't they make it so it's like Hey, wait a minute, you know, you worked 120 hours plus per week. Yes, you survived, but did you really survive that well? How, where's your emotional, you know, connection with people? What happened to your marriage? A lot of them ended up being divorced. What happened to your kids? Do your kids even know you? I don't think so. So they kind of, uh, they have this fantasy world that, well, I survived, the, you know, this resident can survive or, you know, this fellow can survive. and I'm like, you've lost touch with the reality of how hard it was when you were going through, and now the changes are being made for the better. You're sitting there going, well, they shouldn't have had, they shouldn't have it so easy. And I'm like, they're not having it easy. They're just having it a little easier. Yeah. Yeah, what cost? So why do you think we're so, uh, the people, like the administrators and the head of the departments are so reluctant to, um, you know, weed out uh, the people that are doing the bullying? Well, because at this point in time, if you weeded out the people who are doing the bullying, you'd be weeding out probably everyone who's over the age of 25 <laughs> because it's so rampant in the medical world. It's just, it, it's everywhere. I mean... I- I've come across numerous scenarios where medical bullying has occurred. And, yes, the culture is is slowly beginning to change, such as what happened with the Libby Zion case. It's slowly beginning to change, such as with Swartz Rounds, which is a uh, an hour-long time period for all of the staff, nurses, social workers, residents, fellows, you know, whoever wants to go, they can go to Schwartz Rounds once a month and present a case that's really hard, present a case where they're having problems, present a case of a patient who has died, and they receive the support and the encouragement and the physical hugs and the affirmation that they did everything that they could possibly have done. Yes, they there can be situations within those patient cases where learning can occur but it's it's given to the person who's presenting the case in a way that they can accept it they realize you know this could have been better but hey these people they they told me they've had similar situations that had similar cases they handled it this way they handled it that way and it it's done in a, in a in an environment of acceptance of everyone in this room can improve, including the presenter, and we're all going to walk out better for having attended this last hour. So that is helping a lot with the personnel, nursing staff, social worker staff, resident staff, PA staff, physician staff, everyone. It's helping everyone across the board to see that hey, I have a colleague here. I have someone who is, you know, really upset about this particular patient. And they learn how to, how to be encouraging. They learn how to give physical hugs. They learn that there's an, an emotional connection that is needed between the team members. And so Schwartz Rounds has really helped out. Wow. Now, I was thinking when you were talking about the 70s and 80s, you know, you had the... Uh, you had baby boomers that were working in that environment, and then you had the Generation Xers, and now you have, you know, millennials, and, and soon you'll have the Generation Z. Have you found that the, some of the changes are because you have this uh, collab or just this interaction with all the different generations working together, and we're realizing that uh, what used to drive one generation doesn't drive the other? I'm finding that the culture 
and it doesn't matter whether it's Gen Xers, Millennials, Baby Boomers, you know, whoever they are. Um, it just takes a really long time to change the culture. It takes a really long time for everyone across the board to realize that this activity that you just did is a bullying activity, and you need to stop doing that. Here is how to be your be a team leader. Here is how you can learn to respect the resident. Here is how you can encourage the resident to continue to learn. Here is so if there's a lot of behavioral changes that have to occur. Um, I know one of the changes that has occurred here at the medical school at the hospital here in Denver that I've been real pleased with is the fact that they now have a ethics committee. And if you have a problem with someone at the hospital within all the various training programs who is being bullied, they can go to the ethics committee and it's an elderly um, professor emeritus who really understands work environment, bullying, that kind of stuff, and they can go and talk to him totally behind closed doors. He never says to anybody who you are, and he and his staff go about changing the work environment where this particular occurrence has happened. And they have made some pretty substantial changes in regards to the work environment, in regards to the physicians, in regards to retraining the physicians. Um, there's a whole um, area over there right now that just talks about and addresses retraining of the physicians, training them in regards to leadership skills, encouragement skills, working with others, um, being a team leader, and there's a whole arena, there's one whole center that just does that. So these things are changing. They're, the culture is changing, but it's taking a really long time. Yeah. Is it just as prevalent, Sharon, in private practice? Because you would think, well, if someone's private practice, they're going to have to treat people good or, you know, they have options, they can go somewhere else as opposed to like a big hospital or something? Well, unfortunately, in some of the private practices, it is still happening. I can recall just like a year ago when I was working for a private practice and it was a solo practice and the physician, she, it didn't even bother her to walk into our shared mutual office and just start yelling at the top of her voice at me because she was mad about the fact that I had contacted the patient's specialist, because this was a primary care office, I had contacted the patient's specialist and asked him on the phone, how do you want me to deal with this particular problem um, regarding this particular patient of yours that you're going to be seeing in two weeks, and how do you want me to change his meds and, and you know, in between now and when you see him. And the cardiologist told me, he says, I want you to change this man to this, change this man to this, and make sure he keeps his appointment with me. I was like, great. I hung up the phone, and she walked in and started yelling at me because she said, you're not to contact the specialist. I'm to contact him. And I already knew that answer anyway. And I says, no, you did not, because you don't even know what he told me, and you're telling me something totally contradictory to what he just told me. So you would have given me wrong information, and she just about blew her lid. So, yes, it still does happen, even in private practices, um, unfortunately. And how that is going to be changed, I don't know. Um, but I do know at the hospitals and at the medical schools and the training facilities, they are slowly coming around and slowly changing and addressing the work environment that so desperately needs to be changed. Hmm. It's interesting because, I mean, obviously we're in this day and age of, you know, the the, uh, the you know all the um, you get online and this digital age, and so I happen to know of someone who has acted as a physician. So I knew someone years ago, a few years ago, and they were getting uh, a lot of bad reviews, and so how does that 
Well, I, I guess more of the bullying can be amongst, you know, physicians and nurses and stuff. But she was, you know, this particular doctor, she was being bull- kind of bullying some of her, you know, her the people that worked for her. But ultimately, it was some of the reviews that she was getting that kind of made her get her act together. And I just, you know, kind of thought that was interesting. Does does that affect things? How, you know, the reviews uh, physicians can get and whatnot? Um, physician reviews, like on Health Grades and Yelp and some of the other ones, unless they read them, you know, it's not going to affect them because they don't even know what the reviews say. And yeah. sometimes physicians can walk out of the physician office and, you know, they can be upset at the physician because the physician has given them disappointing news. So you have to know what happened within the visit that has created this, quote, bad review on the part of the patient. Some of the, some of the bad reviews are legitimate and they have every right to say, you know, what they say. But sometimes the bad reviews are not legitimate because the patient is just, you know, mouthing off and that kind of stuff and just saying I'll get that I'll I'll get that physician and I'll put a bad review on for them. Um so it goes both ways. It goes both ways, yeah. Yeah, on the other side of it, it made me think of the tech industry that I know of and I know the attorney industry that the older that we get we realize how small the world is. And before we had the internet, people would kind of talk amongst each other, but now you have some of these online uh, you know, closed communities where it's like, oh, you're going to work there, you might, this is what you should prepare for, which would dissuade people from working for certain people just because of that work environment. Are, are you seeing how technology is playing a point to to maybe curb some of this workplace bullying as well? Um, I've not personally seen that. I mean, I certainly wish I could have seen it when I'm thinking about a particular scenario that I was involved in just about 10 years ago where one of the hospital administrators tried to kill me. Um, She physically assaulted me, and yet the hospital did absolutely nothing about it. Um, And I just about went to the police and filed, you know, a police report on her and pursued it through the criminal court system. Um, But... Until the hospitals from the higher ups take responsibility for what's going on on the day to day environment, on the floors day to day in regards to how the residents are being taught, how they're being treated, the fact that they need respect, they need to be validated, they need to be encouraged, that whole environment needs to be changed. And until that environment is changed, it's just going to continue. And whether technology has anything to do with that, I can't tell you whether it will or not because we're talking about a relationship between people, you know, human to human. And technology doesn't have a lot to do with a emotional connectedness between two people. And that's where the bullying occurs. Yeah, and I was also wondering, you know, decades ago, we weren't, so from a technology standpoint, we weren't used to all of the cameras and things that we have outside now, and, you know, now it's commonplace, and in many cases, you have cameras inside of the buildings in your workplace, so I was just wondering, is there a, a, a continued encouragement to, you know, not only improve your workplace environment, but also have those cameras as as teaching lessons. I mean, in many cases, if you don't have some type of physical evidence beforehand, it's one word against another. And and based off what you've been saying, if you have a higher standing, you may have uh, more weight in getting a decision going your way. Well, I can see where cameras would help out. Um, I know with Dr. Wimble's research, she just recently came back from New York City where there had been an awful lot of physician suicides at Mount Sinai Hospital and there was cameras outside of Mount Sinai Hospital and within, I think it was, if I remember right, it was one physician a week for like four weeks that decided to end their life and they 
went on top of the hospital and plunged from the 11th floor down and you know they died when they got to the bottom and there was cameras all over that hospital and the cameras caught the physicians doing this and yet the hospital said oh well it's not our fault we don't know anything about that it's not our fault just keep working and they completely ignored the residents and the fellows who said we need to recognize this is going on we need to recognize this person and what they brought to the table and how wonderful they were and yes they were depressed and yes they had anxiety but they did some wonderful things and it was a way for the people left behind to start healing their heart and the hospital wouldn't even allow them to do that until dr. Wimble showed up and they had a funeral service and then a march for the physicians who had uh, basically killed themselves that way. And that, that's why I was happy because you're, you're behind the scenes. You actually get to see the day-to-day. And as, as a uh, civilian, we're, we're looking at television where they solve all the answers in 60 or 30 minutes. And uh, as you were talking, I was thinking about that. There was an episode on The Residents. Uh, I don't know if you ever watched that show, The Resident on Fox, but there were, they had addressed the, the suicide aspect and so, you know, the next episode, they were able to put up a, a, a wall so people couldn't climb over it, you know, because they were using it as an example of, uh, I'm going up to the top of the building to smoke, and that's where people were actually jumping. They were catching them on camera. But then when they put that barrier out there, and they were also, as a result, also, they were able to kind of go back because people are, leave, are starting to leave signs. And so when when from a bullying standpoint from high school if there's a shooting or something and they after in the aftermath they ask well were there any signs and in many cases there are and i was wondering uh, in some of the research dealing with suicide or just improving the environment are, are we seeing some indicators or a new person that's coming into this practice are there indicators that they can kind of identify and then kind of cut it off at the past instead of oh this is something i'm going to have to deal with my whole career um, there are some indicators. Dr. Wimble has come up in her research with various different indicators, but many times those indicators nobody else knows about except for maybe the wife, if it's the husband who's a physician, or the husband if it's the wife who is a physician. So a lot of times those indicators are within the family. They're not out there for you know their fellow med students to know about or their fellow residents or that kind of stuff to know about so um, it's just a matter of we who are involved in medicine need to be encouraging we need to be supportive one of the things that I have done a couple of times with physicians that I know and I can't tell you how totally appreciative they have been uh, of my doing this is to give the physicians a, an emotional affirmation a validation of what they have done give them positive strokes um, I've, I've actually written poems for new for several of them um, and have that printed up I've had pictures put on one of them as a photo collage because he loved birds so I wrote a poem about what he was doing as a pediatrician. I tied it into his bird loving and how he was going to fly off and do this research for the kids that he was wanting to work with. And then I had a, all sorts of birds that he loves as a part of that collage. He just had more tears in his eyes than you could imagine because he finally realized somebody finally understood what he was doing and they finally got him. And he was just, he couldn't, he was overwhelmed. Um, I have given it to a cardiologist that I know. Yeah, I knew he wanted to have a certain biography of a cardiology mentor that he really had worked, spent a lot of time with. And this biography came out of this particular cardiologist at Harvard. So I got the book. I wrote him a poem about everything that he did um, in his work in cardiology and the next time I saw him he said that he had taken the poem he had gotten it framed and he had to put it up in his office and several of his colleagues in cardiology came in read the poem and turned around to him and said why can't that happen to me where's the person in my life to give me this validation like you received 
And he told me later on, he says, he will forever remember the day that I gave him that poem and that book because he finally received the validation he had been waiting for for 40 plus years. Wow. So, Sharon, you had mentioned earlier that you had that experience, you know, what did you say, 10 years ago, and you were attacked at, at the, job, the job place? Correct. Yes. So when you reported that to your superiors, I mean, what exactly did they tell you? Um, when I actually, after it happened, I went back into my office and I tried to call my supervising physician and tell him, and he was at a dinner, so he wasn't around his pager. The next morning, I waited for him to come into the main administrative um, office with the Department of Medicine, and the person who had attacked me was waiting for him down on the first floor. Our offices were on the fourth floor. She was waiting for him down on the first floor, and she caught him in the elevator, and she said, I did such and such to Sharon, I'm sorry, um, and I won't do it again. And then she got off the elevator. He came in, he saw me, and he says that this particular administrator would come in and, you know, apologize to me for what she had done, and he said that she promised that she would never do it again. And I was like, "Uh uh-huh, right, Um, I don't believe you. So she never came in to apologize to me. She didn't want to be around me, I sent her an email and I says, I'm giving you the white flag of truce. Are you willing to have a truce with me? She completely ignored my email and in fact started blowing up at me later on, um, getting really angry again. And I was just kind of like, okay, I should have gone across the street to the ER and had them take pictures of my neck because her finger marks were on my neck that night. But I didn't do it. I didn't think about that because I was just, I was so upset. I was just crying for an hour at the fact that she actually tried to asphyxiate me. <laughs> wow. You think it's a professional environment. <laughs> How could this even happen? Uh, but as you were explaining and living through that, it, it made me think of IQ versus EQ. And in many cases, you, you, there are instances where someone's really intelligent from a book standpoint, but they don't have that emotional uh, maturity. And I was wondering if there's even any outreach because they can identify somebody that's really good in their, at the top of their field, but they're person to person or their, their bedside manner may be lacking. But the fact that they're so successful in another area is just never addressed. Well, I mean, you're talking about emotional quota or quotient, Um, and yes, there are, you know, physicians and there are administrators that they don't have that emotional connection with others, and they don't know how to be a leader because they're still dealing with their self-assurance, they don't have self-confidence, they don't have respect, they're dealing with their own depression, they've got all this other stuff going on in their emotional keg, if you want to say that's what it is, Um, and so they don't know how to reach out to somebody else, and they don't know how to connect with somebody else, and they don't know how to lead. They've never been taught how to lead and be the leader and garnish the respect and garnish the honor that is deserved for that title, Um, and it's unfortunate You know, there are a lot of people who, yes, they have their master's in health administration, they have their master's in, you know, business administration or whatever, and they should know how to do this, but they're not necessarily taught that during their MBA or their MHA program. Um, That needs to be taught, but I think it's much more innate at times that you're born with it and you're given the correct environment in which it can grow and become better and better and you become, you know, more of a servant and you learn how to help others and you learn how to lead others. So then when you go to get your master's in business administration or your master's in health administration, it's already there and it's kind of innate. And so now you're learning the skills, you're learning how to do the paperwork, you're learning the skills, you're learning how to 
you know, do the finances and do the accounting and that kind of thing, and you come out with your degree and you're very, very good at it, and there are others who come out with their degree, but they didn't have the innate ability to reach out to others and to really see the need for that emotional connectedness, if that makes sense. No, it makes a lot of sense, and it makes me think of some of, like we were talking, like you were saying, some of the changes and some of the positive changes. And over the past 10, 15, 20 years, you, traditionally people would go straight through, so, you know, undergrad and then advanced degrees. And then universities were finding out that they didn't have any real-world experience, and so they really couldn't negotiate, you know, better salaries unless they had real-world experience. So you couldn't even get into the advanced degrees until you had a couple of years' real-world experience. And then I think that's where you would see some of the shortcomings and how you can overcome some of those shortcomings and become a better person once you graduate and now you're at an elevated position. Well, and I also think people need to, when they're in the work environment, they need to have an attitude of continual and constant learning. They need to have an attitude, of, I don't know everything, and this person or that person or maybe that person down the hall has something that they can teach me, and I need to be willing to learn what they know so as to become a better person. And it's, it's a matter, it's just, it's an attitude is what it is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree, but and I also think uh, that's why I want to get your opinion on the inside because every industry is dealing with with uh, mentoring, and it's fallout from me too. So you have some people that won't even look at mentoring the next uh, group, be it from a gender standpoint or what have you, due to any fallout or association because you're saying you're spending 80 hours and in many cases 80-plus hours with a person, and you're starting to learn – a lot about that person there in many cases I mean to be honest the, the human element comes in and there's relationships and then that relationship burns out and now there's litigation involved so I just wanted to know about the environment for mentoring and and how it could be a better scenario to grow beyond the medical bullying there are physicians and I have come across them and I have thoroughly adored them um, in regards to mentoring, so a lot of the senior attendings are incredible mentors. They love to teach. They love to mentor. They love to show the junior staff how to do things, how to improve upon things. And when you come across a physician like that, everyone just like wants to attach themselves with super glue to that person because they are so wonderful. But unfortunately, at this point in time, those kinds of physicians are still somewhat on the rare side. Um, they're, they're, they are not as common as they need to be. Yeah, I would think and that's where if you could have a perfect work environment, right? I know there's a lot of demands for hospitals to bringing revenue, and so some of these high flyers are bringing in a lot of revenue, so the people can turn their head of, of any misdeeds. What would be an ideal scenario where – the hospitals or the business are still getting the revenue targets that they need and still produce a, a healthy environment? I think a perfect environment would be where the medical students and the residents and the fellows are taught by the senior attendings with respect. They are honored for what they know. They are encouraged to learn more. They are never, ever demeaned. They are never, ever bullied. Um, And subsequently, the physician sees within the junior staff, this is a strength of yours. You need to pursue that strength. Or they see within another person, a junior staff member, a particular strength, and they encourage them to go after that particular strength whether that be you have a really strong mind, detailed mind regarding research, go into a research field, or you have a really strong mind, detailed mind in regards to connectedness to patients, so you need to be an internist because you're really good with your connection with the, with the patient and able to talk to the patient. Um, so it, a perfect environment would be the senior attending recognizing within his junior attendings, his team members, their particular strengths, not demeaning them at all, 
not bullying them at all, but helping them, encouraging them, um, allowing them to learn, showing them opportunities to learn, and really being that incredible mentor that I've been around a couple of different times. And like I said, I wanted to super glue myself to them. Um, I'm so sure. And I was just thinking uh, many people in their lives are not really linear. And uh, and even in your own life, as you were saying, you know, there are some, uh, I had to go back for something, something happening in the family, and then I was able to re- regain and go back to my uh, dish, uh, my traditional trajectory. And what happens is when you take some of those detours, some of your mentors or other people will see other strengths that you have. And I'm bringing that up because I was looking at KevinMD.com and you had written an article there. And I was just wondering if there's an environment where, you know, some, some it could be junior people, senior people, where there, that may be a, a, a way for them to promote their expertise and other things as far as getting out of the day-to-day. And if you're, it's, a, it's a social media site, so other people are seeing what you're writing about, and, you, and they may identify areas of strength that you never knew about, which could actually take your 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 business experience and your your work ethic to another another level. Well, I mean, I if I remember right, I have like twelve articles on Kevin MD. Some of mm-hmm. it in regards to you know patients that I've taken care of or particular scenarios that I've been involved in, and I've enjoyed writing on that, uh, being a guest blogger. Um, I also have, I believe it's now 80 patient stories on my blog, uh, which is pabymedicine.blogspot. So I also have another website, which I'm just now beginning to get up and running. But one of the things that I love to do is I love to teach, and patients always love being around me, learning from me, being taught by me, being seen by me. Um, so one of the things that I'm, I'm currently doing is I'm doing an outreach on Pinterest, and I have, if you know anything about Pinterest, it, you create little pins, and each pin is basically like a poster board. And I've been doing quite a bit of poster boarding on medicine and how patients can take care of themselves at home or when do they need to go see the physician based on things that I will list on my post on my on the various boards that I have put on Pinterest and I'm now getting quite a bit of feedback from that so there are lots of different ways to reach out to patients and to encourage them and to help them out and to make their lives better um, and I've had to basically kind of back away from some of the stuff that's going on in medicine to be able to do some of these other things. And in, here in the very near future, I am planning on buying a medical practice. In fact, I'm in the process of buying one right now. And then I will start seeing patients and I will be my own boss. And, you know, hopefully that won't happen again. And I know how to treat employees and treat patients because I've been through the ringer myself and I know what's right and I know what's wrong. And I think that's the intrinsic motivation in itself because you have an upcoming TED Talk, so I'd like for you to talk about that, but it also shows that we don't have to accept what our current circumstance is. If we realize there, there's something that needs to be changed, we could try to change that within, and if that doesn't work, there's other tangents that we may not have thought of but we have, especially in 2018, with, with all these social media sites and, and sharing and Pinterest and TED Talks and all that, there's outreach where you can actually find yourself in another stratosphere that you hadn't imagined. Well, doing a TED Talk is an honor, and there's a lot of people who have done them, but in regards to how many people who actually apply to do them, um, it's like one in ten get accepted, so the acceptance rate is not very high right now, which is good because then they get the best TED talks, um, the best the best TED presenters. I'm going to be planning on doing two TED talks. One is going to be on medical bullying, which we have just been discussing, and the other one will be on healthcare fraud, uh, where I have come across numerous scenarios of physicians who have done at least two and a half million dollars worth of health care fraud a year for 10, 20, 25 years so far. And I've been working with the FBI 
to get these cases closed down and addressed by the FBI and criminal charges filed. I mean, wow. Is, I guess that's speaking of what we were just talking about. You're, you're a healthcare advocate and didn't start your career thinking that way, but uh, here you are. No, I never thought I would come across health care fraud, ever, ever, and I've come across several scenarios of it, unfortunately. Um, and then in regards to medical bullying, I never thought that medical bullying would affect me. I never thought I would be involved in a physical assault case and be the victim of one. Um, but that's not the only time where I've been involved you know, been the victim of, of a medical bullying from a senior attending to me. So it's just way too rampant, and it really does need to change. Thankfully, it is changing to some degree. I'm very grateful for what Pamela Wimble is doing regarding physician suicides and really trying to stop the physician suicide. She's reached out to I can't tell you how many people and stop the suicide from occurring. Um, she now has a movie called Do No Harm. It's a documentary that's out, and it's being presented in front of medical schools and um, at various hospitals and that kind of thing. And it's bringing up the whole issue of bullying, suicides, all of these negative things that are going on in medicine. And all of this is needed and more to bring about the positive change within the medical culture that it has so direly, desperately needed for decades upon decades. Wow, well, well said. Yeah, and I think that's the comfort, uh, comforting thing that with you bringing this to the, to the masses and letting them know and your colleagues, it can only get better. So, you know, keep up the good fight. I've definitely motivated and, and glad that you took the time to speak with us about that. Until your TED Talk happens, if you, this would be a perfect time to talk about how people can get in touch with you, read some of your blogs and your, your Pinterest pages as well. That would be fantastic. Um, on Pinterest, all they have to do is just look me up by my name, and they can get on my Pinterest pages. Um, as far as my uh, patient blog, which is, I believe, almost 80 patient stories of patients that I have taken care of, it's a educational. I will um, basically do like a paragraph of, here's this patient who came in, they had these symptoms, Here's the questions that we ask, and then I'll break in and I'll say, here's why we asked those questions. Here's what we were going after. And then I'll go back to the patient, and here's the additional symptoms that they had. Here's the answers that they gave us. Here's the diagnostic work we did. And then I break back in and I say, here's why we did this. This is what we were looking for. This is why we were doing it. And then I'll come back and I'll say, here's what happened with the patient. Here's how we treated the patient. Here's the end result of what happened with the patient. And here's how they did so much better. Um, so that's how my PA view on medicine.blogspot.com is all set up, which is I've had lots of positive reviews from people who have come onto that page, onto that website, and really enjoyed reading the stories and learning a lot in regards to how can they take care of themselves better. I've had PA students from Australia who were trying to get the Australian law set up for them, and they had the physician attendings read my blog, realize what a PA could do, and that has helped them set up their laws in Australia for the PAs just within the last five years. So that's a very positive for that particular blog. Uh, and as far as my other blog, I'm trying to, my other website, I'm trying to reach um, moms, wives, kids with my other website because it's an author's website where I have published a book uh, for Christian women and I'm going to uh, very shortly put on my juvenile mystery uh, novel on that website for the kids because I've had numerous kids tell me they love my juvenile mystery that I wrote. So, and there's all kinds of blog entries on that website as far as how do you be a better person, how do you be the leader, how do you address your depression, how do you address, you know, your anxiety, all of that sort of thing. That's on the author's website which is strengtheningyourfaith.com. That's and fantastic. If, 
if they want to get a hold of me, they can get a hold of me via my email at colorado P is in Paul, A is in Apple, at msn.com, and I'd be happy to converse with them. Awesome, awesome. And you have just been in tune to another episode of Intrinsic Motivation from a Homie's Perspective. This is Hamza. And I am Daily. Sharon, it was definitely a pleasure, and you are definitely in the trenches making change happen. We'd love to follow up with you in the future. Well, thanks for the phone call, Hamza, and nice to meet you, David. Yes, nice to meet you, and thanks for being with us. All right, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks again for checking out another episode of Intrinsic Motivation from a Homies Perspective podcast. Please check us out on our website at intrinsicmotivation.life where you can click on the speak pipe button and leave any suggestions for a future podcast that you'd like us to cover. Also check us out on our social media sites. We have a YouTube channel, Facebook page, iTunes podcast, in addition to Stitcher and Google Play, all under Intrinsic Motivation from a Homies Perspective. Check you out next time. Have a great day.